welcome um, to our CASA Distinguished Lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker today, uh, Professor Dr. Melanie Volkamer from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. So uh, Melanie has got, a, got an impeccable uh, technical background. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she she basically grew up grew up on crypto uh, and and working working with it doing her PhD um, and she is uh, a, a, um, an expert in um, particularly has has looked at electronic voting systems very closely. Uh, Melanie is also she's she's got a sort of second persona um, as one of the leading uh, usable security. Uh, researchers and um, has has looked at, at various non crypto. Um, so, so she's looked at the understandability of crypto there as well. And, and, you know, sort of what we call the Johnny problem um, in, <laughs> in crypto, uh, but also also looked at at, at, at um, security awareness, for instance, uh, and she and I published a paper last year together on why so-called um, anti-phishing training, simulated phishing training is really um, a huge annoyance and a waste of money. But today we're basically with the topic um, topic she's talking about today, we're returning to, to one of the, um, this question she's been looking at for a very long time. And that's, um, that, that's one aspect of electronic voting. So uh, where she brings that together with the usability, usable, verifiable electronic voting. So Melanie, without further ado, I'd like to invite you to, to give your talk. Um, you can post questions um, on the chat uh, or on the Q&A. Uh, what we're trying to do is basically, uh, if there is a question that's really important for clarification or understanding of the talk, then I will, I will raise it. But otherwise, uh, discussion type questions, uh, we're going to leave for the, um, for the end of the talk where we'll, where we'll, uh, we'll have the Q&A. So, Melanie, thank you so much for making the time for us today. And we're really looking forward to your talk. Mm, yes, um, so welcome uh, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks Angela for the kind introduction <clears throat> and uh, for the chance to talk about electronic voting <clears throat> uh, in the CASA Distinguished Lecture. Um, <clears throat> the work I'm going to present is uh, research that was conducted with both former PhD students <clears throat> and Karen Renault, and there's one PhD student that I want to mention in particular, which is Oksana Kulik, um, <clears throat> who has done a lot of this work together with me and <clears throat> who is nowadays a assistant professor at the IT University in Copenhagen. Um, <clears throat> Angela already mentioned it, so <clears throat> I have started doing research on electronic voting, <clears throat> um, but then it was not that attractive in Germany anymore because almost no one <clears throat> actually used electronic voting. But then <clears throat> there was a pandemic uh, coming uh, last year <clears throat> and everyone was looking for, in particular, remote electronic voting. <clears throat> so I started to go back to this topic <clears throat> uh, more and more and uh, in order to find a appropriate solution. But what are we going to talk about today? Um, I will give you a brief introduction into so-called end-to-end verifiable electronic voting systems. Then in the main part, I will talk about our usable security research we have conducted, and I will conclude with open research questions and directions. Um, in order to make it easier for you to follow the talks, uh, to talk <clears throat> some remarks. So first of all, I'm purely talking about secret elections, polls or referenda. So it's important that we protect vote secrecy. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I'm only talking about uh, remote voting, meaning online voting, internet voting, but I'm not talking about coercion or coercion resistance <clears throat> because I kind of assume it's used in parallel to postal voting, where we already have accepted that people cast their vote in an unprotected environment. Uh, last but not least, um, I also don't focus on the authentication of voters, but I simply assume for this talk that there is kind of a secure postal channel to distribute voting credentials. Okay, so it was just some remarks. 
Now, uh, as I mentioned, there is the pandemic and people start thinking of online voting. <clears throat> and I think many people think that it can be as easy as many other applications, for instance, online shopping. Meaning you would log in with your username, your password, <clears throat> you make your product selection, you confirm <clears throat> the system thanks you for buying something and at some point the product arrives. So <clears throat> the online voting system should be similar, right? So, <clears throat> okay, you haven't voted online, so you don't have a username. That's why you may receive your voting credentials via postal service. Um, but then you would do the same. You log in with your username, your password. You don't select a product, but the candidate. You confirm what you have selected. The system thanks for your vote. And at the end, it published the result. Would be quite easy. However, what happens if attackers would find it interesting to um, change election results, <clears throat> so, or in general, want to do some harm on the system. If you look to online shopping or many other applications on the internet, yes, we know <clears throat> systems uh, do a lot to protect against attackers, but at the end, nothing is 100% secure. But however, at least on the online shopping side, the attacker uh, would be detected. So that's why he's kind of looking a little bit sad. Um, and so you would notice that you don't receive products that someone bought something and it was sent to a different address. So you would know you could complain, you could try to get your money back. But what uh, if the attacker is successful in hacking into the voting system? It published a result. But as long as the candidate you selected at least got one vote, your vote, you have no chance to see whether uh, an attack actually happened or not. So why should you trust in such a <clears throat> result coming from such a voting system, which we call black box voting systems? What is also worth to know <clears throat> is that there are various types of attacks. You could have someone trying to get access to your device that you used to cast your vote, the network. You could have the typical hackers trying to get into the voting system itself or even internet that may be blackmailed and therefore try to change the election outcome. So that's what you don't want to have. And so you don't want to trust that none of these attacks actually happens. And if you don't want to trust you actually need to uh, uh, use a so-called end-to-end verifiable electronic voting system. Of course, even if you use an end-to-end verifiable system, hackers could try to <clears throat> change votes or the election result, but it's not attractive anymore because using end-to-end -end verifiable electronic voting means you can effectively detect manipulations and again, react. So that's what you want to have you want to be able to detect manipulations and then decide, in particular in this case, decide to rerun the election, go back to paper-based elections whatsoever. What does it mean end-to-end? -end? Actually, we distinguish two parts. There's, first of all, the individual verifiability, which starts on the voter side and goes to the voting server because it contains cast as intended. So you want to know as a voter <clears throat> that your vote has been cast as intended. And secondly, you want to be sure that it's stored as cast. And then there's the universal verifiability <clears throat> where we want to know that all votes are tallied as stored. And if we know that all votes are st uh, tallied as stored, we also know that our own vote <clears throat> is tallied as stored. Okay, so end-to-end -end verifiability means you want to have individual verifiability and universal verifiability. And remember, we also want to have secret elections. And that's where cryptography comes into play because you need a lot of cryptographic primitives and protocols and a lot has been proposed in order to get both secret elections as well as end-to-end -end verifiable systems. Now, today we want to talk about uh, usable security research in the area of end-to-end -end verifiable systems. To do so, it's actually important to understand that the individual verifiability is something the voter needs to conduct 
because otherwise vote secrecy would not be guaranteed. And the uh, universal verifiability can be done by everyone, it could be the voter, some experts, or some trustworthy institutions. So if you want to look into usability, it's first of all important that the individual verifiability is usable for the voter. So the voter should be able to actually verify cast as intended and stored as cast for his or her vote. So that's why for the rest of the talk, I will focus on individual verifiability. If you look to the literature, there are a lot of proposals how voters can conduct these two steps. I try to categorize them into three different types. So there are some proposals where the individual verifiability comes from the voters point of view kind of on top, mainly after having cast the vote. So that's, for instance, an approach that is used in the Estonian voting system. There are other proposals where the verifiability comes both during vote casting and after vote casting. And the most prominent approach here is the so-called Helios system that has been proposed by security researchers. The third category are those that follow a more integrated approach as it is done by the Swiss Post for many of the um, online elections conducted in Switzerland. Now, before I come to our research on two of these systems, I would like to make a couple of remarks on usability um, when it comes to the voting context. Usability usually means you want to have an efficient, effective, and satisfying system. Now, if you look into efficient, and, and, and I mean, there's a lot of usable security research that really tries to make security uh, implementing implemented as fast as possible. Because if you think of, mm, I need to authenticate, I don't know how often on my mobile device during the day. And so I don't want that it takes 10, 20 seconds. So it really has to be fast. However, mm, here we talk about voting and usually we cast a vote maybe once a year, maybe even less. So it's kind of okay to spend some time on vote casting. In addition, we actually need to um, compare it to postal voting, where you also have to go and put it into the ballot box um, in order to get it to the central um, um, town hall or whatsoever. So yes, you don't want them to spend half an hour on voting, but please also have in mind, it's not comparable to authentication on your device because it's okay that it takes some uh, seconds or even some minutes. What is the next one? Effectiveness. Um, we talk about end-to-end -end verifiable systems, including the additional steps for individual verifiability. <clears throat> so effectiveness means you should be able to cast your vote, but you should also be able to verify. And the second one is obviously the most challenging approach. Now, <clears throat> if you want to know uh, how effective the system is in terms of verifiability, you actually need to, first of all, make sure that people are able to verify, but they also need to be able to detect manipulations. And the only way to do this is actually to conduct so-called deceptive user studies. Now, the, uh, the third one is satisfying or satisfaction. Here, it's kind of similar to um, the, the first one. Um, yes, of course, no one wants to take uh, a huge amount of cumbersome steps, but again, it's something that only happens once a year, um, so it might be more okay. Um, furthermore, we actually conducted um, a user study in which we gave people um, different types of systems, having very simple ones, as I explained it at the very beginning of the talks, <clears throat> towards more end-to-end -end verifiable systems, and uh, talked with them about how much extra steps are okay. And actually, um, the answer from all of them was, it's okay to take these extra steps if it's needed from a security point of view. So that's why I <clears throat> highlighted effectiveness, because from my point of view, having effective verifiability is the most important aspect of the three. 
Okay, then we start with the first system. Um, the first one I want to discuss um, uh, our research results on is the Helios voting system. You will see it's quite complicated, so you may ask from a usability point of view, why at all have you selected to work uh, on the usability of the Helios system? And th the answer is more or less, I mean, <clears throat> these, this system was proposed by security experts. And there's a lot of um, literature on it. There are proofs. So there's kind of everything that you want to have from a security point of view. So we thought it's worth studying it. Um, furthermore, um, there is a user study that was conducted by Weber and Hengartner from Canada in 2009 using one of the first interfaces that Helios had. And actually, uh, only 10 of their participants were able to verify. So obviously there was also a need to look into the usability of the verification mechanism used by Helios. Um, before I start to remarks, the general idea how CAST is intended is implemented as uh, the so-called Bandelot challenge. And I will explain in a minute what it means. And our research was focusing on CAST as intended and not on uh, stored as CAST. That's why, um, um, yeah. It's transparent. <clears throat> okay, what have we done? So we uh, used a cognitive walkthrough approach uh, to go through the original interfaces and find out where people could have problems <clears throat> in verifying, where could they think they have successfully verified, but actually they did not. And <clears throat> um, uh, based on uh, our findings, we came up with an improved interface, which we further developed and improved um, with user feedback. <clears throat> so how does it look? Uh, to keep it simple for this talk, uh, for now we assume the voter has already uh, entered their credentials, they have made their selection, and now they are within the screen. So what they get is um, the check code from the system. And this check code is actually a uh, commitment on both the, um, the option that the um, voter voted and the randomness used to encrypt the vote. And now the, there is the voter's uh, choice whether he wants to cast because he trusts the voting system or whether he wants to verify. So if you verify, you actually get um, a lot of um, uh, information um, that you need to actually um, verify, which means um, you ask one of these trustworthy services whether they can uh, encrypt uh, the option with the randomness uh, used by the voting system um, and then compare. So that's what you do. So in this case, you go to the web page of the BSI because you think the BSI is trustworthy um, and um, you enter the information there so that the BSI can actually um, uh, compute the encryption. Um, it also computes this hash value, which you need to compare as a voter with the check code that you have seen before, and you need to check the private party. And now what actually makes it even more complicated <clears throat> is that um, now you, you're satisfied because um, this time the voting system behaved uh, properly, but you cannot cast it because that would be a problem for vote secrecy. <clears throat> so actually, if you go back to voting, you go back to the empty um, ballot, you have to make uh, another selection, the vote is again encrypted, there's a commitment, and afterwards you can uh, decide whether you want to challenge the system again, or you have challenged it often enough so that you <clears throat> uh, uh, believe the system behaves properly and you cast your vote. Um, so um, having explained this, you can already see that it's quite complicated, even that it's getting easier compared to the original one. So we conducted a lab study to uh, better understand whether people are actually motivated to verify. And what is typical in this context, you give people a roll card explaining what they should vote for, because otherwise um, you have a problem with respect to vote secrecy. Um, in the study, we found out that actually 82% are kind of motivated because they at least think they verified. But as we used eye tracking, we know that uh, only 59% verified. 
but at least this number is, if you remember, the 10% higher for our interfaces than for the original one. Um, however, um, I mean, also Weber and Hengartner had many students in their study. We didn't have students, but we also had half uh, with a technical background. So this may also explain the number 59. And 59 is still more or less half of the participants. While ideally you would have everyone that would understand and would want to verify. Um, so there might be a lack of motivation. We didn't know whether it is because of the user study. So it's uh, not their um, actual vote. It's not an actual election. So maybe it's different in actual elections. So to better understand this, we um, uh, did a follow-up study to uh, deduce mental models on verifiability in voting. So we first of all try to understand what you can actually verify in nowadays paper-based elections, in particular those in the polling station, and that's what you can see on, in these pictures. So there's actually quite a lot that the guy wearing the uh, black clothes can observe and can verify, but something like cast as intended verifiability does simply not exist on paper-based systems. So that's something we should have in mind because that makes it even more difficult to motivate people if something like this does not exist in the real world. So from the study we conducted, um, our goal was to um, answer a number of research questions and we always ask them whether they can tell us how to tell that the individual vote was not modified or removed. And, we ask this in many different situations. So we, in particular, didn't want to talk about verifying, but we asked them how to tell that it was not modified. And we could identify a number of different mental models, including uh, the biggest one is trust in people and processes. So people simply trust in elections. So the uh, survey was conducted in Germany and they, even say that they have no knowledge, they just think it works. Um, another finding from the study was that a term similar to verifying was not used by any of the participants, but they used um, other terms and I put the German ones here as again the study was conducted in Germany. Um, both um, the mental models as well as the terminology is something that definitely should be taken into account when start talking with people about verifiability in electronic voting, and in particular to raise awareness so that people are more motivated to actually take um, this additional step. Um, then going back to the system, we thought maybe we can actually make it even more simple. And we try to use uh, QR codes and mobile devices. So the idea is that uh, you don't need to compare uh, this long string yourself, but um, you get it as a QR code, which you can scan with an app. Obviously, the idea is that the app comes from one of the trustworthy um, uh, institutions and not from the voting system itself. Um, <clears throat> if you want to verify, then um, you click on um, uh, start checking and you get all the other information, which again, <clears throat> you can check. Uh, so you can scan using your app. If you do this, uh, the output is the party that you um, selected before. <clears throat> and now it's obviously easier because you don't need to compare the um, long hash value yourself because that's something that uh, can be done automatically. <clears throat> and it obviously only, only outputs the name of the party um, <clears throat> if uh, the hash value is okay. Um, with this approach, you actually also have a small improvement from a security point of view, because remember, uh, we used different web pages before, but everything happened on the same device, while here you use two different devices, so the attacker would need to actually manipulate both um, devices. Um, we wanted to um, compare both uh, improvements. Um, we again gave them in the lab study a roll card. And because of 
uh, that we are aware of the lack of <clears throat> awareness, we actually told them or instructed them that they should verify um, their vote. Coming to um, the result, <clears throat> if it comes to effectiveness, um, we um, have for the improvement 61%. So this was the old one where we had 59% with uh, <clears throat> very technical people. Um, and we have 81% using the QR code. And now if you ask <clears throat> what was the problem, the problem was that many people believe having seen this page and having this button saying um, continue vote casting, they think they are already done and they go with this button. And this happened more often with uh, this first improvement and less often with the second one. So having seen the QR code made them more likely to actually scan this as well and continue <clears throat> to verify. Uh, I also provide you the efficiency and satisfaction values, but more because mm, you will see uh, during the studies that they remain more or less the same. And from my point of view, are uh, giving the explanations from beforehand um, <clears throat> quite okay. Um, there was one other finding because in all our, <clears throat> our studies, we also ask um, people for uh, some open-ended uh, questions. Um, and in particular with the Helios one, we often got the feedback that people are scared with respect to vote secrecy. Um, and the reason why they are scared is because on the second page or on the second uh, view on the uh, mobile app, you actually see your vote again, which is not a problem if you understand the Benelo challenge properly, because the idea is that mm, you actually uh, make any selection and then verifies, um, and only once you are sure you want to trust the system, you go for the vote you actually want to vote for. And therefore, the, I don't know, OSCE or the BSI would actually not learn anything about you. Plus, actually, you have never logged into the OSCE or the BSI. So, but still, um, that's something to take into account if you want to use the Helios system in practice, um, because you don't want a system where people are scared uh, with respect to vote secrecy. Um, there's, uh, there are many limitations, but those that I think are most relevant are uh, in this study, actually people only verified once. So also the idea um, uh, would need to be explained that you should verify as often as you think it's needed. Um, and it was by request, but that was yeah, our decision because we didn't want to also study how to make them aware of the need to verify. And although, um, I mean, with 81%, you may think, okay, there is room for improvement. We were interested in whether these people that actually verify are actually then able to detect manipulations. So we conducted a second study where um, we had to go for a deceptive user study because we could not tell the user, um, our participants beforehand that we are interested in whether they detect manipulations or not because then they would actively search for any manipulation. The question was what type of manipulations did we want to study? And you can easily see that there are many parameter, parameters you could think of, is the attacker interested in changing or just not submitting a vote? Uh, how easy is it for the voter to detect? And there are some that are more easy to detect and some that may even use social engineering techniques that are much more difficult to detect. And you can also uh, think of um, a study where people get additional information about the system and the security features and those without. So for this first study, we decided that we go with an attacker that wants to change the vote. It should be kind of easy to detect and therefore they don't get any additional information on the security features. Um, this was again a lab study. For the same reasons, they got um, a roll card with the same information. Um, this time um, we were mainly interested in the detection rate because we manipulated it. So they were asked to cast a vote for the pirates and actually the pirates 
uh, should appear here, but did not appear there if they went through all the steps necessary to verify. It turned out that we had 77% that actually detected the rate. So now if you remember last time we had 81% that actually went through all the steps. So that means that more or less uh, everyone that um, went through all the steps or is able to go through all the steps also is able to detect such a manipulation. And if we look into the uh, people that did not detect um, the manipulation, we can confirm because those that did not detect actually either did not at all try to verify or only scanned the first code, but not the second one. So the issue was the same as in the study before. Um, the limitations are kind of the same because they only verified once and it was by request. Now, Having done all this research on the Helios system, we need to conclude that there are still challenges for users, in particular for lay users. And the question is, is this a problem? So from a usability point of view, you probably want to say yes, because everyone should be able to verify and to be able to detect, and it would not be fair. On the other hand, there's a discussion going on in the community that it is enough that verifiability is available as long as the computer or the voting system doesn't know who will at the end of the day verify and who not, that's not a problem. I leave it for the discussion and just continue for now and I'm happy to see your opinion on whether you agree that uh, everyone should be able to verify or whether it's okay um, as long as it's implemented. And with this, I want to continue with the second part, the um, improvements for individual verifiability on a second system. And this time we focus on the system that is used in Switzerland and what is um, different is, First of all, it's an integrated approach, and I will explain you in a second why it's integrated. And you can see that there's no second device involved, but instead um, there is something with the voter because the voter does not only get the voting credentials, but also a so-called code sheet. And the code sheet contains per voting option, um, a return code and a confirmation code. Now, the voting procedure is like this. Um, you log in with your uh, credentials, you make your candidate selection, then you get displayed a return code and your task is to check the return code, whether it matches your option that you selected beforehand. And then you're asked to enter the confirmation code and afterwards the system has stored the vote and thanks you for your vote. And so what we started off with was studying the actual interfaces, the actual voting material as it is used in Switzerland. We implemented a uh, deceptive user study um, for the same reason it was deceptive and the manipulation we uh, implemented was similar to the one I explained before, meaning um, we asked them to, uh, to cast a vote for yes, so they would need to see 52SD on the screen if everything is correct, but actually it was a manipulated system. So they saw the return code for the no vote. The question was, would they detect this? And the good news is um, everyone in this user study was able to detect it. So that on the one hand means it looks like compared to the Helios approach, with all the improvements we did, that at least for these easy to detect, uh, detectable it attacks, the integrated approach works much better. And I mean, doing all this usability stuff, um, you likely agree that yes, you could have known beforehand um, that having it integrated is more likely to uh, be a success than what they do with the Bangalore challenge. Um, however, so on the right side, you see uh, parts of the code sheet, how it looks uh, for the Swiss uh, voting system. Um, and um, we saw it both from the feedback as well as uh, from uh, yeah, looking at it, 
from an expert point of view, there are some uh, shortcomings and there is room for improvement so that also more difficult to detect attacks can be detected. And one of the main problems from our point of view was that uh, you get a check code and kind of this graph tells you, okay, next go to the confirmation code and you may miss reading that you should actually go down, search for your party and then check the code. But in particular, if you don't get <clears throat> what this is all about, you may just enter a confirmation code independent whether you saw the proper check code or not. And so what we did is we uh, changed it more in a step-by-step approach where people start entering their credentials. Then they were asked to um, check their um, return code and it has some explicit explanation what to do if it does not match, namely to call um, the support and report that there are some issues. And so the question is, um, does this uh, improvement actually performs better? Uh, both with respect to usability issues, as well as in particular with respect to detecting manipulations. Mm, so the first part is uh, purely about uh, usability. So it was not a deceptive study. They got a role card. This time mm, they were only asked uh, to uh, cast a particular vote, but there was no instruction about mm, participating to verify. Uh, mm, sorry, no request that participants should verify. And the reason was that we thought it's so much integrated, so probably it's not needed to ask them to do this in particular. The good thing if we don't need it would be that you don't need to go with all this awareness beforehand. Okay, so the results are that for vote casting, almost everyone could cast their vote. Those that could not thought that the return code did not match, although there was no manipulation in place, so they thought there is a problem, but there was actually no problem. And here, just to talk once about efficiency and satisfaction, I put the numbers here for the uh, kind of Swiss-based integrated approach versus the Helios one. And you can see that, yes, it takes slightly longer, but we talk about seconds and this is not worth, um, um, yeah, it's kind of okay because it's about elections every, I don't know, once a year. And also the SUS values are kind of uh, similar. And um, so that's again, why I think we should really focus on the effectiveness. Now, um, and in order to study the effectiveness, um, we again wanted to see whether people are able to detect manipulations. Um, this time we implemented two different types of uh, manipulations. There was still the easy to detect uh, one um, that you can see on the left side where you get a return code back. And the question is, do you notice that it's different? And secondly, <clears throat> that uh, the second manipulation where you did not get any return code, but you were just asked to enter your confirmation code. Um, again, we did not tell them um, that it's important to verify and uh, people were randomly assigned to either the original or the improved system and to either one of the two manipulations. Now, if it comes to the detection rate for the easy to manipulate it one, uh, we reach with our improvement 100%, uh, while in the original system only 76% percent uh, uh, have noticed it. However, if we look into this more difficult one, we have to say that also for our improvement, only, only 44% actually reported the um, manipulation. Um, furthermore, again, from the qualitative answers, we noticed that uh, some people that reported that they have detected the manipulation would actually have called the number provided on the web page, which would most likely not be the official support, but the support by the attacker. You may say there is a limitation because there is no additional information. We did not explain them why it's important to verify, why it's important to take step by step. Um, and that's what we want to look into next. Um, 
uh, to see whether we can increase the 44% if we give them some information about uh, the security features, be it via a video <clears throat> or flyers. Okay. So finally, I want to uh, talk with you about an experiment uh, that we are currently running in cooperation with um, Oksana, uh, Jonas, uh, Rito, and uh, Philip. Um, what I have shown you so far was there was a voting protocol. <clears throat> there were uh, proofs how, it, how secure it is, and we tried to make the interfaces as usable as possible. <clears throat> but why not? trying it the other way around, um, taking a more human-centered approach to see how can we design a voting procedure um, implementing CASA's intended verifiability, but with ideally no error-prone task. And then once we have it, we go to the crypto community and ask them to come up with an underlying protocol. So exactly the other way around what has happened in the past. As I said, it's an experiment, so we started with something, and uh, I just want to give you what we did. I mean, you need to have some idea what you want to verify. And so we actually went back, back to the integrated approach as it performed much better than the Helios uh, one. Um, however, if you look to the security literature, um, people would not be happy with this approach because a voting system, voting device actually learns how you voted because you click on the candidate or the option you want to vote for. And in the literature, there is already a proposal how you can cope, it, cope with it. And the idea is that you don't click on your candidate or your option, but you actually add a so-called voting code. And this voting code is individual for you, so the voting device has no clue what this code actually means. So I, I said I want to make it more usable, but you may now think, but actually she's not making it more usable because now there are even more codes that the voter needs to enter. Um, it's getting more and more error prone, so why is that? And actually, this is why there's not much research on this idea from the crypto community. And there's no convincing voting scheme that would go with voters entering a voting code to cast a vote, then um, compare return codes, and then enter confirmation codes again. But we thought, OK, we had this idea of using QR codes with the Helios system. Why not using it here as well? Maybe we can uh, improve the uh, voting ceremony as, uh, yeah, as good as that we can propose it for the community. So what we have done so far is um, we um, thought, OK, every code that needs to be entered could be a QR code. And the good thing about QR codes is that you can even put more secrets, more proofs. You can put so much information into one item and obviously much more than what you could ever ask a voter to enter. And that may even be good when we later on want to define, uh, to come up with voting protocols. So what we have done, um, we thought, okay, you need to make some security uh, you need some security requirements before you can start, because if you would design uh, the voting card as you can see it on the left side, it would not be secure because you put your camera on top of it and you would get all the information as an attacker and you could actually uh, manipulate the vote without uh, the voter noticing it and you, could, um, uh, you would know how he voted. So we came up with some security requirements. We went back to the findings we had from previous studies. And uh, so the current approach that we take is that we um, have uh, a leaflet, um, which has a front and a back page and an inner page. And as you can see, it needs voting cards. And the idea is that you get voting cards for all the options. You select the one that you um, want to cast, you put it, place voting card here, and then you scan it. And uh, afterwards, you get the uh, return code that you still need to compare. And then you can uh, scan the confirmation code. 
um, and at the end, um, the system will give back you the finalization code. So, <clears throat> and here are some ideas of the interface and the idea is just to give you an idea how easy the interfaces from the election web page uh, can look like for such um, um, <clears throat> uh, voting ceremony. Um, so in particular, uh, Jonas conducted a uh, first user uh, study <clears throat> to evaluate the usability of this approach and to get feedback. <clears throat> this time it was conducted at home because of the pandemic. Um, so we could not ask people to the lab, but they um, received their study material and their voting material and were asked to use their own equipment <clears throat> at home to cast their vote. Um, in terms of the results, there's uh, the effectiveness. Um, we had only 95% that um, could cast the vote. Uh, the problem was that some had very old mobile devices where it was simply not possible to scan the QR code uh, from a browser. Um, you could argue that this would not have happened with our own devices in the lab, but it was not in the lab, so we only reached 95%. Efficiency could not be measured and satisfaction the system usability scale was more or less again the same as it was before in previous studies. Um, we haven't studied it uh, with manipulations. We haven't studied it with additional material. We got a lot of feedback. And as I said, this is just an experiment to see um, what we can do if we don't focus on the exact voting protocol behind, but we focus more on uh, tasks that are not um, error prone and that can be more likely conducted by everyone. With this, <clears throat> I would like to summarize what I have talked about so far. <clears throat> um, I hope I could convince you that it's important that we use end-to-end -end verifiable voting systems that there are many different approaches available also when it comes to the user involvement for the individual verifiability. I introduced to you some contributions that we did from a human perspective, both on the Helios system and the Swiss system. And finally, I try to give you an idea of the experiment we currently run where we try to uh, start more on the user side and then would later on ask the crypto community to come up with a voting protocol. There are some open research directions and questions. Um, you may have noticed most of the schemes I have been discussed um, would not work for visually impaired voters. So that's definitely a direction um, we should look into it. Whenever we have verifiable systems, you need processes to handle complaints. That's something that I think more research is needed. Coercion resistance and authentication challenges are there, which I did not touch. And finally, I think there is a need for decision support for selecting voting schemes because there are so many different approaches that all have their advantages and disadvantages. And for election management boards, it's much too complicated to select the most appropriate one at the moment. And there was this one question I raised during my talk. <clears throat> so is awareness needed? So should everyone be able to verify and detect manipulations? Or is it enough that verifiability is provided <clears throat> as the system does not know who verifies and who does not verify? I'm happy to see um, your opinion on it. And uh, my final slide, uh, I would like to come back to the uh, ballot I showed you on my first slide. My impression, unfortunately, is that um, many decided due to the pandemic to go with simple and easy to use black box systems. And uh, it's interesting to discuss how we can make decision makers aware of these verifiable systems and make them to actually use them. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions and discuss some of the questions I raised with you.